a brand is no different than a reputation is no different than a, a resume. You know, I think people are, are scared of the word brand because they think it's, it's self-promotion. Selfish. But that's what it is. Yeah. That's why you do it. Right. That's why you do it. You go to school for self-promotion, to go get yourself a job, to go get yourself a career. You're not doing it to take the entire class with you. That's not how it works. Yeah. School is not a team game. It's not. You graduate and you all go to different cities. That's the reality. And if you didn't set yourself up to succeed in those four or five years, man, good luck. Right? right? So it, a brand <laughs> is your future. Whether you like it or not, you don't like the word, fine. Call it something else. I don't care. But set these kids up so that when they walk into a room, that interviewer already knows who they are and is already anticipating wanting to give them the job because they've been reading about them and seeing them and hearing about them. A brand is no different than a resume. Let that quote sink in. That was from Jeremy Darlow, one of the leading brand consultants, I believe, on planet Earth. Hi, my name is Yogi Roth and welcome back or welcome to the Yogi Roth Show if it's your first time. Welcome. I hope you enjoyed. If you've been coming back, we appreciate the love and support. Make sure you subscribe, rate, review, kick it out to your friends whenever you can. Now, today's episode is one I've been really excited to share with all of you. I've known Jeremy for a couple years now, former director of marketing for Adidas in football and baseball. He's an adjunct professor on marketing all around the country, and he's written two books. One is Brands Win Championships, and one is Athletes Are Brands too. You can check out all of his information at jeremydarlow.com. Now, when I had a chance to meet Jeremy for the first time, it was a really eye-opening experience because he asked me a lot of questions that I did not know the answers to around my story, around what I wanted to share with people around my quote-unquote brand. And when I hear the word brand and when coaches in athletics hear the word brand, a lot of times our stomachs turn because we see 15 and 16 year old kids saying, I got to develop my brand, man. I got to develop my Instagram page, my Snapchat, my following on whatever social media platform that I'm into. And none of us really like that. But when you listen to Jeremy talk about somebody's brand and how there really is no difference between your brand and your resume and ultimately your story. And those that have followed this podcast know we dive and love to dive into people's stories then it kind of can settle in a little bit more. And I truly have bought into everything Jeremy talks about and teaches and shares so much so that he and I actually collaborated a couple of years ago and he helped me around my branding, around my story and getting really clear about it. We talk about that in our conversation. So I think you're really going to enjoy Jeremy, not only from the marketing and branding advice he's going to give anybody, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a coach, whether you're in business, whether you've got your own personal brand, there's so much of that clearly going on right now in the market. But also his story and where he came from, the origin of all that and how it's driven him. And I don't think once you hear that, you'll be surprised by his massive success. He's somebody that LA Rams call upon, He's somebody that individual athletes at the professional college level call upon. You ask any high school athlete who Jeremy Darlow is, all their hands are going to go up because they follow and track how he's teaching them to develop not just their quote unquote brand, but their voice, their story, and ultimately their resume so they could utilize athletics to better their life as they grow up and kick out into the professional ranks as unfortunately all of us don't get to play forever. Now, it's also really important to talk about who makes this podcast possible. I partnered up with Kona Red Coffee. And if you don't know about them yet, go to KonaRed.com. They source some of the dopest coffee in the world. I was just in Hawaii and that's where this coffee is grown in the volcanic mountain slopes of Hawaii. And if you know that soil, you know how nutrient rich it is. And, and even more important than the quality of coffee they have, I think what coffee does and how they view it is why I love the partnership. They view it as a catalyst to conversation. And that's exactly what all of these podcast episodes are about. It's about conversation and peeling back layers in people's story. And I like to think when I'm having a cup of coffee with a friend or somebody I meet for the first time, we're just peeling back layers on who we both are, what our dreams, aspirations are, or even just what our day simply is going to look like. And that's why I love this partnership. And you can dive in whether you like cold brew, whether you like it hot and you just want uh, just the regular coffee beans. I think they're premium. They're To me, they're as good as you can find. They even have this juice called the Hawaiian Cascara juice, which is really unique um, in terms of saving the waste that sometimes coffee produces. So everything that Kona Red is doing, I'm all on board. Check them out at Vons, Albertsons, Pavilions, Ralph's, Bristol Farms, Sprouts, and much more. That's KonaRed.com. Really appreciative for their support. 
All right, speaking of support, go to yogaroth.com if you want to subscribe to our newsletter. We think it's getting better and better. Hopefully, we're giving you guys little seeds, little nuggets every week that you can add to your toolbox to help you out in life so you can maximize your potential and, and tap into the best elements of your story. So speaking of that, I'm going to get to today's story. It's with Jeremy Darlow. To me, an expert in marketing, branding, and probably most importantly, understanding what your story is and knowing how to share it. Peace. I always say, Jeremy, I've told you your face. I'm going to tell it to our audience now. You saved me 10 years on my career and our work together. So thank you for joining the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay, so how do you describe yourself? Jeez, that's a big question. Um, you know, I think, unfortunately, I probably describe myself through my work first. Uh, I'd say passionate, driven. You know, I, I'm the guy that, that gets there first and, and leaves last. You know, I'm... I'm a writer these days. I love writing. So I'm in the coffee shop from, you know, nine in the morning until they close at nine at night. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'd probably describe myself more based on kind of the work that I do right now. I think I'm just so obsessed with it. I think I'm so succumbed by it that that's, that's just my life. I love that. So you've written a couple books, Brandsman Championships, Athletes of Brands too. Been able mm-hmm. to uh, be a little bit of part of the, the latter. Yep. You're working on another one. You're in the lab. You're grinding. Uh, but coming early, staying late, that to me is a, a factor of a DNA that gets programmed at some point. When did you become that type of spirit when you think back? Yeah. So you and I talked about this a lot. Actually, we talked about it today. I grew up poor, right? I didn't have a lot of money. My parents uh, didn't have a lot of money. We, you know, the, the fridge was empty a lot of times, most of our life, lives, quite honestly. And I've been running from that life ever since. So, you know, since I left college, my goal has been to get away from that. Uh, so that meant, like I said, that meant you get there first and you leave last, and my grandparents didn't go to college. Uh, for some reason, I'd always think about my grandfather. And he worked at, the, at a grocery store his entire life. And every time that I would feel like I need to, to pull my, put, take my foot off the gas, I'd think of him and I'd think I can't let him down, you know? So from the very beginning, as soon as I left school, I went to Oregon State. As soon as I graduated, I said, I'm going to outwork everybody. And I tell all the kids that, that ask me, how did I get to where I am? I worked harder than everybody else, bottom line. But the first three years out of school, to me, are the most important years. You know, it, Those are the years that separate people. And 10 years after graduation, a lot of the guys that, that I went to school with, a lot of my friends, they, they, they reached out to me and asked, you know, hey, can you help me get a job at, at the time I was at Adidas? And I said, no, I can't. You know, because you, you don't have the resume right now. You didn't work your butt off, you know. And now you want that dream job. And that's not how it works, you know. So I've been running from the sort of, you know, the, the, the scared place that I was in as a kid. And it's a chip on my shoulder, but it's helped me, you know. I think as you get older, that chip kind of, uh, it shrinks a little bit. But, you know, you still, you still, you're driven in other ways now. So that's, that's I think it all started there. What, what's it, what did it feel like to have an empty fridge? Well, I was hungry (laughs) a lot, you know, I played sports, so, you know, you're eating a lot of food. Um, but it was just normal. You didn't know. I mean, I didn't know. I was a kid. I thought that's how it was. You know, I thought there's a, there's a, a week and a half window where you're, you got lots of food and there's, uh, two and a half weeks of the month that you don't. You know, and I thought, okay, I get it. I, maybe I just eat too much, <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just, you know, crushing this food faster than we can, we can afford it. Um, but the thing that really was tough was we'd have conversations about money quite a bit, and that at an early age. I mean, I can remember being like seven or eight years old, thinking, "Man, oh, we can't go to McDonald's today. You know, we don't have enough money for that." And I would be worried about that, and that it scarred me. You know, I, now I, I think about money and I manage money in a way that's based on that experience. Um, but yeah, it's it's a uh, as a kid, you know, you you kind of don't know it's different because it's what you know. Who did you look up to? Like, who do you remember as being like one of your first idols as a child? 
my brother was my hero as a kid. He was the he he has a different dad. Uh, I have I have two siblings. They both have different dads. Um, but my brother stayed with us. I was an only child essentially for most of my life. Um, they lived with their their dad. I lived with with my parents, uh, our mom. But he stayed with us for about a year and a half at some point in middle school for me. And he was in high school and he was the guy I looked up to, right? He was the guy that the girls in my school at my school would come over and I thought they were coming over for me, but no, they were just coming over to heck to hang out with my brother, you know? And he was the funny guy. He had all the charm. He had all the charisma, all of my humor that I have today. And, you know, it may not come across on podcasts, but I have some humor. I got some jokes and it came from him. He, he was the funniest guy. He would crack everybody up in the room. He'd make everybody smile. He would break down any walls, any tension. He was the guy. So he, he, is, he was really the, the person that sort of I wanted to be like growing up. And how is that relationship now? Well, not to be a downer, but unfortunately he got into to the, the drugs, you know, and that's, that's our, that was our upbringing. We were brought up in a, in a world where drugs were the norm um i think maybe that just happens you know when in certain economic situations it might be more common obviously than than others but i think you in those situations i I just had this conversation with somebody i think you either go left or right i don't think there's a middle in that world you know i think you either go down the path of drugs or you don't and i was the one that of the three decided not to even i've never touched anything you know and uh, but if, unfortunately he did, I've seen him, uh, a little bit here and there, but unfortunately we just don't, we don't see each other much, you know, but he's still, when I do see him, he's, he still makes me smile. He still makes me laugh. Uh, he's still, you know, he's still the guy that I knew. Yeah. When did you fall in love with, cause when I receive you and we met, she's three years ago now Yeah, in a coffee shop in Portland. It was Mike Yam at the Pac-12 Network, <laughs> you and myself, right. we posted up on the way to your alma mater Oregon yep. State we were driving down there I believe and you you predicted they would have eight wins that season I think they had two I know so I was I was on the train appreciate you I, I totally I, I let a lot of beeves down I apologize for that <laughs> um but Jonathan Smith he's gonna write the ship he's yep. writing the ship currently uh, but when I receive you to me you're a seeker of story and you want to urge people to tell their story authentically you just shared yours with me and in a clearly a vulnerable way that it isn't just you and I in a coffee shop anymore. Like a lot of people are going to listen to this thing and, and learn part of your path. When did you want to, and I may be wrong here, but when did you want to commit your life to not just giving people a microphone? That's easy today. Just have a smartphone, but helping them curate their microphone and do it in a way that could make them smile. For instance, as your brother made you. That's a good question. So, I will tell you the the full backstory. I'll, I'll shorten it up. But sophomore year in college, I took a psychology class. Um, I fell in love. It was an elective. I didn't have to take it. It was random. I just needed to fill some some credits. First day of class, it was everything that I wanted. I decided at that point, my major is going to be psychology. I'm going to be a sports psychologist. My career is set. Come to find out there's no jobs in psychology. It's a difficult uh, vocation for sure to to find work in. So what I did was I added business to psychology, came out with marketing. It's essentially the same thing, uh, just on the business side of things, right? You're you're looking at the consumer's mind. You're understanding it. You're trying to figure out what they need, what do they want, uh, what are their desires, and and how do you fulfill those? And that's where stories come from. Uh, on the business side. It's from the marketing department. It's from the brand team. It's from the social team now. Back then, uh, you know, there was no social. That's, you know, um, you and I are of the same era. Uh, Social didn't exist. So you were telling stories through print and through TV. But, you know, it it all comes from the same source. It all comes from the same department in in a corporation. So I think that was something that I really found interesting. and, And I think that's why I got to marketing. But I remember if you're going to ask me what ignites me and gets me excited about helping people tell stories, I think it is my upbringing again, honestly. I remember sitting in our basement. I've never told you this story, actually. 
I remember sitting in our basement, the first sort of epiphany moment that I had in my life, and probably the only one that I've had, that changed everything for me. I was 18, I was by myself, the TV was on, I don't know what was on the TV, but something came over me and I realized, this is going to sound really corny, but I realized I could be the best person I could be. And I realized everybody's the same. You know, you and I actually just had a conversation about this. LeBron is just like us. You know, he has more money, right? And he can shoot a jumper better than we can. But he's vulnerable. We're all vulnerable. If somebody breaks up with us, we're going to be sad. And I remember thinking that, God, I could be, I could just be the best person I could be. There's nothing holding me back from being a good person. And guess what? I walk down the street and I realize that person that, that may have, you know, cut somebody else off they're no different than us. They're probably just having a bad day, you know, that something got in their way and, and frustrated them. And I, and I just think we can all use help, you know, and I, I happen to be good at this one thing of this one marketing aspect of the world. And I'd like to use it for good. You know, I'd like to use it to help a community if I can. I'm not going to change the entire world. I'm not going to bring peace to the world, but I can do something good and I can I can hopefully affect the lives of at least a like I said a community. And for me, I'm just passionate about sports. It's not that athletes are the only community that need brands and need stories. But that's the the avenue that I've I've sort of chosen as a career and that's a group that I think need help. You know, they go through life with one focus and people around them are telling them, shoot the jumper, shoot the jumper, shoot the jumper, throw the football, throw the football. And and you don't talk about play the piano. You don't talk about write that book. You don't talk about learn that, that math equation. You're talking about one thing in their life. And guess what? If they blow their knees out either or either knee, it's over. And now what, you know? And I, I think there's an injustice there that, it doesn't take much to fix. It's just a matter of, of widening the scope, you know, and the gaze, right? It's, it's not just the jumper anymore. It's the jumper plus whatever it is you love outside of basketball or outside of football. I can remember being in college, I went to Pitt and played football there. And I can remember the second year I was there, it was the seniors. They all come back and they all say the same things. And that still rings true today. If you make the NFL, you come back and you say, man, it's a business. Even if you're a first-round draft pick, if you're Larry Fitzgerald, or if you're a free agent, you say the same thing. And you basically say that it's not that much fun anymore. Mm-hmm. And now I'm just part of a larger community. Unless you become a Hall of Famer, right? Which is clearly a very small group. Or you, ta- you come to the parties still when your career is over and you're like, man, I miss it. Point being, the identity you have as an athlete is built from probably being fifth sixth grade i remember mine being like you're good i knew it country knew it or the, the town i knew it the state they eventually would know it and then maybe a larger footprint would know that and you are told what your identity is you're going to be the slot hard slot wide receiver the walk-on who busts his ass great at blocking and really really sure hands like i was like oh yeah okay so that's me that's my identity and we didn't have social media back then clearly but i say that because i think now athletes they're still being told what they are because they need that. They need the guidance of this is your role on our team. Mm-hmm. But there's this whole other world where they get to share their dreams. And because people follow sport, like we both know and have had built careers off of it, people want to lean into those stories more and maybe even connect to those people and then eventually help them. I always tell athletes, get three business cards every day after practice because these people want to know you now. By the time you're done, they're going to go meet the next slot. Yeah, they don't care. Yeah, well, or they're not as inclined right? to yeah, lean I in. don't think they care. I'd that, like to not issue. believe that. I totally. I, I'm yeah. with you. I wish I believed the opposite. Maybe one of three cares. Fair. But I don't think there's no chance all three care. It's not the society that we've set up, right? right? It's social media. It's Twitter. It's Instagram. It's celebrity status. You want to be next to the person that you saw on TV or has uh, the blue check next to their name on social. That's You get cred just by knowing them. Right. You so, know? so here's, here's why I bring that up. Because I think the work you've done, which is what I want to celebrate, is you've allowed athletes to recognize that it's their job to share who they are, what they're about, what their essence is, because it'll benefit them regardless of who cares, because they're taking advantage of it when people do. Did you set out to do that? And when did you recognize that it was working? I did not set out to do that. No, I I mean, my first book was about building 
team brands. And I started writing that, what, 12 years ago. It took me 10 years to publish it just because, you know, life gets in the way. But while I was at Adidas, I re- recognized a lot of these athletes would come in and they didn't have a plan. They didn't know what brand was. They knew the word. They knew it was important, but they could not define it. And, and honestly, most people can't. It's something you have to learn. And I, But I just, I, I felt bad about that. I felt like what's going to happen when these individuals, men and women, are not being showered with praise and they're not, there's not 75,000 people cheering them on when they catch, you know, that first down over the middle, you know, that's got to be really, really difficult. I mean, you can, you can probably attest to it. You played uh, major college football, you know, you beat my Oregon state beavers in a bowl game, no less. So you can attest to it. I can't imagine the come down from that. And, and if you don't have a plan and you're not set up to still excel somewhere else and still feel that identity exists in something else, it's got to be really difficult. So it was, it was more of my time just in corporate America and, and being around these athletes and working with them in, on marketing campaigns and just seeing that there's an opportunity to, to help. So what do you tell athletes? Because I, I see it now with the Elite 11, right? You've seen it in sports. You know, you ran marketing in baseball and bas- or baseball and football, excuse me, mm-hmm. at Adidas, not basketball. Nope. And uh, I see these kids come out with 80,000 Twitter followers, Instagram followers, right? We see basketball players. Kid at Duke had like 2 million yeah. coming in <laughs> to college. Trevor Lawrence had, I think, 80,000 Instagram followers before he even practice once yeah. with Clemson. Now he won a national title and he's going to go down the history of college football forever for doing what no one's done in a really long time. Mm-hmm. I say that because we can, it's like we're trying to arm them with these tools to share their story. I don't even like, I, I get the word brand, but to me it's like, who are you? You know, what are you about? What attributes do you have? And then your world will say it's brand attributes. It can help you in the marketing, but it's really like your story, right? It's mm-hmm. what you're talking to these kids about. I have, I would love your take on at 18 years old, you may have 2 million followers, be the basketball player at Duke, right? Or be Trevor Lawrence, but you're still emotionally and your emotional intelligence is still 18. Like you still are going through the stuff like, like you referenced, you're still human. So how do you coach guys up or talk to them around not being like the politically correct, you know, I call it like the politician figure says all the right things, does all the right things versus being human when all of these eyes are on them and they're building their so-called brand. That's a really good question. So the situation that I was in at 19 in that psychology class, a year later, I knew I wanted to be the head of brand marketing for football at Nike or Adidas, right? So I knew at 20 years old, my ultimate goal. Wow. So that, that's rare. None of my friends knew that. But it, it made everything easy. I knew what to minor in. I knew which classes to take. I knew which jobs to accept. I knew which jobs to turn down. I turned down jobs knowing full well they would take me off the course. The reality is these kids, I know they're 18, but I don't think that means they're not equipped to make those kind of decisions. I don't think they're being taught. You know, Yeah, you're human, but at the same time, you know you have a goal. Just like playing football, you know if you're, if you're going to, you want to, play quarterback for Alabama, you need to carry yourself a certain way. They're not going to take you if you act like a knucklehead, right? You can think in those same terms when it comes to what you want to do outside of sports. You can have that same discipline at 18. You can have it at 14. I don't care how old you are. You know, you are human, but at the same time, if you have a goal at 14, it might be about Legos. You have a goal about Legos. You want to build a certain structure. You're going to stay disciplined and you're going to every day after school, you're going to hit that Lego thing and build, 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 right? You're going to get on the floor and build. So I I, I don't believe in the, you know, these kids shouldn't be thinking about brands at, at 17, 18. Well, why are they putting together resumes then? Why are they doing internships? Why are they going to college? They're doing all those things in order to set them up some set themselves up to succeed you know it's the same situation so yes you're human but you're also human at at 17 when you're when you're doing you know band and you're playing football and you're and you're in drama and you're doing all these extracurriculars so you can get a scholarship i remember first game of larry fitzgerald's career 
you know, they basically roomed us together and said, Yogi, teach him the offense and have him take your job. I was like, all right, cool. Thanks. I get it. Like easy lead. Uh, but the game ends and I, I want to say we played like ball state. It was one of those like whack non-con games kick off every season. And the game ends and you go to your locker and you change and you put on your sweatsuit. And Larry put on a suit, which is what we wore on the bus to the game. And I went over to him and I was like, yo, dude, like you ain't got to do that. Like I'm trying to be the, the junior, like the <laughs> advisor here. Yeah. And he goes, oh, no. Every time I'm ever seen in the history of my career, I'm going to be well-dressed and I'm going to have a suit on. And he was 18. He was, he's 18 years old. There and you know. now, would you say uh, he's definitely one of the top five, top 1%, probably top five athletes in terms of being a repu- having a reputation about being a true professional. Mm-hmm. Right? And he set that in motion. So that's where I think, like, that's where I think the magic and also the blurred line is. Because if we were both 18, 19, 20, and we said, go to whatever your favorite spot was in Corvallis, mm-hmm. or go to Peter's Pub in Pittsburgh in Oakland where I went to college, and that was the Thursday night spot. And I had a phone. My IG story might be like some bad rap music <laughs> and me, you know, having a blast. Yep. And, and I think that's the blurred line of like, can we allow a, t- a, a kid who's a brand or teenager, a young man to, who's a brand based on everybody else's opinion of him to still be a kid and then not judge him off of that? Like, what do you say to those guys? And they're like, man, I just want to kind of have fun. Like, why do I need to? It depends on your goals. Yeah. If, you, if your goal is to have fun, then have at it, man. Right. Do, do what you want to do. But we live in a different world. It is what it is. Right. You and I were lucky. You know, I had some moments that, thank God they're not on TV because I had too many drinks, right. you know? Thank God they're not on, on social media. That didn't exist. We, we were not individuals. The average person was not a celebrity. There was no E! Entertainment Television back then. There was no Twitter or, or Instagram. But there is now. So I, I'm, I can't be, I'm not going to apologize to you because there's Twitter now. It is what it is. The world has evolved. So now you just need to understand what, it, what the situation is and adjust. If your goal is to have a blast, look, Gronk has a blast. He's a good time. He's basically a frat guy playing football. If you think of one guy that you would equate to a frat guy in the NFL, it immediately is Gronk. And guess what? That is his brand, and it is authentic, and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with having a good time. There's nothing wrong with getting drunk at a, at a wedding. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, you got to conduct yourself in in a certain way you know you can't do anything that offends anybody and you can't get in the car right but if you're just dancing in the middle of a circle man have at it that's awesome and guess what that's why he's going to be on the wwe what do you what do you think about uh like overall sport let's just take football for instance right it's i believe it's the ultimate team game i think it's like the only like legitimate every person on the field team game Right, like in soccer, like you could be kicking it, like the goalie does, isn't involved in every play. <laughs> yep. Right, in basketball, you could have two or three good players and you could roll. But I think in football, like truly, it's like eleven guys on every snap have to do their job to fit the puzzle and find success. Right, every play is drawn to score a touchdown if everybody does their job, which is hard to do because the other side of the ball is designed to do the same exact thing, stop the offense from doing what they want to do. Right, I say that because how many times do we hear that phrase? It's the ultimate team game. And how many times do we hear the, the idea championed of, hey, you got to sacrifice and do what's best for the team. And, I, and I'm cool with that. But I, I wonder if I think back to being like 19, I bet I'd be confused if I was like, well, I'm building a brand too, man. Right? Because now, like when I was in college, I had five internships and I built my world, but I didn't talk about it. Like nobody, like the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette did a story on it possibly, you know, but there wasn't social media and people all over it and, and feeding you know, the, the beauty of that chase to develop my career past football. Now there is. So I wonder what you say to programs that are like, hey, man, team first. It isn't about you and let's just say you like fashion and your Instagram game or you and gaming and you loving yourself up as a video gamer or you or whatever your passion is. Mm-hmm. And that tough balance between celebrating you as a member of this 11 as a starting offensive lineman or as a greater population as an individual hashtag whatever your name is. Yeah. Well, here, here's the difference for me. You don't go to Oregon State football. You go to Oregon State University. It's school. There's a difference between playing for the Giants and playing for the Beavers, right? If you're playing for the New York Giants, you are an employee. 
Now, I still think you should be thinking about your personal brand and what do you do outside of football. But if the owner says, don't do that, you better not do that because you have a boss. But in school, I think it's different. I think we've, we've gotten confused as to the mission behind a university. You don't go, in my opinion, you do not go to school to win football games. That is not why you go to school. It's called school. You go there to learn. You go there to set yourself up for life. You know, so if you're going to win a ton of games in four years and graduate and not go to the NFL, well, then what? And if, if you're not set up to succeed and you, and you have that, if you struggle to get a job after being a, essentially a celebrity on a football program, then the school did something wrong. That's ridiculous. I think that's such a miss. And I think it's, it's a detriment to the athlete to say, there is no I in team. Stay off Twitter. Okay. Well, guess what? As soon as I graduate, I'm getting on Twitter, and now I don't know how the hell to use it because you didn't teach me. Right. You told me not to, to do anything on Twitter, and now I'm out here saying stupid things because you never gave me the, the principles that I should be thinking about when I do tweet, right? You got to teach these kids how to be adults, how to be professionals, and how to succeed in life. That's the point to me. I'd, you're not going to school for football. No offense. I know it offered you a certain lifestyle, but man, you didn't go there to play in the NFL. You went there to learn how to become successful in life. Yeah, and that's interesting because there aren't a lot of athletes that think that way, right? They're like, I'm going to this school. We just had signing day. And by the time this airs, it'll be a couple weeks old where kids are like, I'm going there because you can get me the league. I'm going there because you, I'm going to start and play with so-and-so. And there is a shift when you're in college where you're just like, maybe you didn't achieve the hype that you had or you just get a little older and you're like, oh man, it's not just about what I thought it was about at 16 when I was getting recruited and everybody was loving me up and all the schools and all the teams. And you're like, it is about the future. So what would you say, knowing like y- you can foreshadow and see that moment when the kid's heading into a senior year and maybe he hasn't been a two-time All-American and left early already. And they're like, yeah, man, I got to get ready for my life just in case I don't make it here. What would you tell somebody at 17, 18, because a lot of athletes listen to this podcast around like step one of strategy of, okay, I don't want to freak out and screw this opportunity up in three years, be begging Jeremy to take a phone call with me to help me and build my brand. The biggest thing is just looking in the mirror. First and foremost, anything that I do, any brand that I build, any brief that I write, any plan that I I create, it starts with just research. You know, you need to understand yourself and the brand that you're trying to build. We're talking about personal brands, so it, it literally is looking in the mirror. You know, what do you love? What gets you out of bed? You know, you and I went through this process, right? I can't tell you how to build a brand unless I know what it is that gets you fired up because you're not going to build a brand around something that is completely based on money. That's completely based on financial gain. If you don't love it and it's your brand and your brand alone, you're not getting out of bed for it. You're not going to work your butt off to make sure it succeeds. So the first step is literally just taking a look at yourself. What do you love? What are you good at? You know, and again, When that alarm hits, are you pressing snooze or are you firing off the bed and getting ready to go? You know, because you're thinking about, oh man, I want to work on this thing. I want to work on this brand. I want to work on this, this passion project that I have, you know, that's the first step. I tell every athlete that I talk to, you need to understand yourself. You need to dig in. And that's the sad part. It really is. Because when I ask these guys, what do you love outside of football or basketball or baseball, whatever it is, a lot, God, I would say, I would say 90%. They don't know because they haven't thought about it. All they know is football. And I, I'm, you know, I, I work with the Rams, fortunate to do that. And I worked with a lot of the rookies, a lot of these guys that were invited to camp and you knew most of them weren't going to make it. And to your point, every single one of them was thinking, well, I'm a football player. All I know is football. And I told them, I was like, look, for one, you're not going to be able to afford me not to sound like a jerk, but that's the reality. You have two weeks with me right now and, and two more later if you make the cut and then you know we have the season after that. But if you don't make the team, you have two weeks. So take advantage of this. I know you got, you're trying to make the team. I get it. But take 15 minutes a night. Ask me questions. Think about life after football because if, if you don't make the team, guess what? You don't get the consulting. You don't get the, the phone calls from all the fans that love you for being on the team anymore. You don't get the... the you know, those tertiary friends, quote unquote, that are there, those things fall away. If you don't have a plan, you're starting from scratch. 
it's a miss. So for me, you got to figure out what do you love outside of the sport and build that. Why do you think that's such a hard question? Because whether it's athletes or athletically minded individuals or people working in sport, which is pretty much our world, like that, that's a tough question. You know, I, I worked for Coach Carroll for a while. We wrote his book together and like the core of the book was helping people figure out their philosophy in 25 words or less. And I do it with high school guys that just finished in the NFL all the time of first thing I ask them to do is I say, write down a list of 50 things that you want to do in life. And from there, we'll find some themes. Maybe it's travel, exploration. Maybe it is football, like whatever it is. Uh, but, but again, back to the question, why do you think it's so difficult to answer what is it that you love? Well, if you're in college playing, especially D1, especially Power 5, if you're playing, oh God, even at the Rams of all places, if you're at that level, you've been working on that one thing most of your life, right? That's all you know. And the people around you have told you, well, keep working on that throwing motion, keep working on that jumper, keep working on that baseball swing, right? That's what you're focused on. People aren't telling you, oh, by the way, now you need to go from baseball to the thing that you love, which is graphic design, right? We're going to take an hour out of your, uh, your batting practice to go design some posters. Nobody does that because there's quote unquote, no money in graphic design. The money and the future is in professional baseball, professional football, professional basketball. And I think that's so backwards. There's so many people that are just around these kids because of the lottery ticket scenario. And that's the thing that it breaks my heart, man, because again, what is it, 2% make the NFL, you know, and the average career is two and a half years. It got, these guys get just beat on, you know, and one bad, one, one cut that doesn't go your way and your knee blows out and it's over right. and they don't care anymore. Well, I think, I think that the, the turn that we've seen, and if you track Jeremy on social media and please check him out, um, or if you just track sport, I think that there's a, a paradigm shift happening. Because I think athletes are becoming more aware. Like, there's definitely a big group of people that are like, I just, you know, play ball, live ball, and ball. And where I get frustrated in the academic system is that, like, if I go to USC, I can major in ballet. I can't major in football. Like, I hope that changes. Because the essence of football and the love of it spurns countless careers. Clearly, like, coaching, media are two Mm -hmm. easy ones. But also law, right? There's contracts. Also, uh, art, creativity, design, as you just referenced, mm-hmm. that's in every team. Like there's a million jobs that are athletically minded. I would argue almost every job, if you come in with the traits of an athlete, you're going to find success at. So you, we just talked about some of the dark spots and the, and the unfortunate areas of athletes, mm-hmm. but you're on the front lines of guys that want to change. You talk to a lot of guys. I watch them on social media and I'll text you. I'll be like, do you know, uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson, UCLA's quarterback. And you're like, never met him. And I'm like, dude, he's just tweeting at you about a video he's putting out about his brand. So mm-hmm. it's happening. What have you noticed? Because you, you're in the middle of it. You're in the DM game. You're communicating with guys all the time around the shift of athletes saying, I am a brand. And mm-hmm. I'm going to share that in an authentic way. It, it's definitely shifting. Now, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like the continents shifting, though. You know, it's going to take forever. You know, it's not, it's not a speedboat. It's a, a really? freight liner. Yeah. I mean, think about school. Think about university. Did they teach you how to build a personal brand? No, but I, but I, when I watch kids now and they see like LeBron, Kevin Durant, Andre Guadalla, I think like those have become like the new professors. But how are they teaching you? Yeah. Maybe not like the steps. You don't You're know, you don't know the it. steps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think the thing that shifted is brand is in the vernacular. People know that it exists and that it's important. They don't know what it is, you know? I mean, you're, you're a personal brand. You're a monster of a brand right now. You're, you're, I mean, your momentum is crazy, but I had to teach you some things. Yeah. Oh, we right? went to work for a year. Yeah. I mean, of all the people, I would have thought you came in with all the knowledge. And it'd be the same thing. Like, okay, I'm, I'm talking on a podcast or I speak at a, a conference. You would teach me, you'd run circles around me on how to speak in public. You know, I don't learn. I don't, I don't live and breathe that stuff every day. So these kids aren't living and breathing brand. I live and breathe it every single day. Mm. I'm writing about it. I'm writing, I'm researching and writing about brand marketing constantly. I'm building brands, whether it's athletes or teams or coaches or companies all day, every day. That stuff is not taught in the universities. It's not. And I know that because I was a general student that nobody cares about. that didn't have a scholarship and they didn't teach me. They taught me, you need an internship 
which is a, a one sentence class. You need an internship, go. They taught me how to, uh, I could take a class on building a resume. And uh, I think there was some, some opportunities to, to learn how to, to job interview. Well, guess what? Everybody has an internship, everybody has a resume, and everybody gets an interview eventually. So I'm no different than anybody else. You didn't teach me anything, right? You just taught me that good luck, it's, it's a jungle out there. So until people are actually teaching this, and that's what I do, right? But I'm one person. I can't touch everybody at once. You know, I get, I get tons of DMs from high school athletes, college athletes, pro athletes. How do I build my brand? I, I say, read my book. I can't teach you mm-hmm. over DM, right? I can't teach you how to build a brand that way. Right. But I, I think until it's going to take time. I think until the tools are there, and especially the education system catches up, I think we're still going to be in the phase of, I know it's important as an athlete, but I don't know what to do. Yeah. What do you say? Well, let me preface with this. I've talked to coaches about you a lot and everybody leans into you. And I've also talked to a lot of coaches around when an athlete leaves, what do you give them? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, do do you give them like as simple as this sounds like an electronic press kit with a couple clips from when they got interviewed, a couple of great articles, maybe a letter, three letters of recommendation, coordinator, head coach, position coach. Mm, that's great. So they can walk out, athletic director, whatever. So they can walk out with like, I'm not just identified as an athlete. I got some, I got some stuff to me. I have some essence to me that can let me walk into this new world that isn't playing, but it is the professional community with a little bit of something, just or a little bit of anything. So I say that for you. What what would you say to to coaches that are, I, and I believe the greatest coaches are old school in spirit, new school in vernacular and how they communicate. Mm. Old school values, new school approach, right? So it's old school values of we got to be disciplined, we got to be physical, we got to be competitive, we got to love our craft. New school communication is not put your helmet through his chest, mm-hmm. right? It's rugby tackle sure. or whatever it may be. So what do you say to coaches that are like, I know that this brand thing's real, and I know these kids don't understand how to build a brand. What do I do outside of, of course, bring you in and, and give them your book is the first thing I, I hope you'd recommend or they would already have done. But what, what would you say to them? What would I say to coaches? Yeah, what would you say to coaches that are trying to figure it out mm. but, but don't have the answers? And to your point, branding 101, 201, 301, 401 is not part of a lot of these academic institutions around the individual. Hire somebody to teach them, you know? God, how much money are in these football programs? It's crazy how much money goes in and out of the football programs. And you can't afford to, to bring somebody on to teach these kids how to build a personal brand. They should be walking away with a side hustle. Every single football player, basketball player, baseball player should have a side hustle that they can take. And if their sport is not going to be their future, they have something else, mm. right? What happens, you, you mentioned it, guys walk in basically with their jerseys on to job interviews and think, I played quarterback for X, Y, and it's like, okay, bro, I'm a marketer. I've been doing this for 15 years. You throwing a football has nothing to do with what you're applying for, right? right? These kids need to be thinking about other things. It's not just test taking. I, I am not the biggest proponent of the way the, the education system is set up, honestly. My own experience, I'm, I'm cramming in the middle of the night to memorize formulas and definitions, Right. These kids need some real world experience. They need to learn from people that are in the industry that have seen it, that do it every single day, and they need to practice it. They need to start thinking about brand development. They need to start actually putting pen to paper and and presenting it and testing it. You know, they can't wait until they graduate at 22 and they've been solely focused on test taking, memorization, and that was a small fraction of their day, and then the rest is football. Yeah. That just doesn't work. Do you feel as though, um, because the word brand is, is uh, it's interesting, right? It's, it's received differently. But if I walked into X football program and said, I'm going to help you all identify and share your story and leverage your story for your future. To me, it's the same sentence as I'm going to help you identify what you love, AKA your brand and how you can use football to enhance your brand. Do you agree with that? Or is that just the safe version of like... I think it's a safe version. Yeah. You know, it's, okay, you're telling me a really cool story. I could tell you my story about how I grew up and I had a, you know, we didn't have any money and I didn't have any food, but that's not getting me a job. It's not, yeah. right? I can tell you I love to write. But unless I have a book, 
that people can hold in their hands. Okay, I'm not giving you a book deal. I'm not buying anything. I'm not giving you this job. It, look, a brand is no different than a reputation, is no different than a, a resume. You know, I think people are, are scared of the word brand because they think it's, it's self-promotion. Selfish. But that's what it is. Yeah. That's why you do it. Right. That's why you do it. You go to school for self-promotion, to go get yourself a job, to go get yourself a career. You're not doing it to take the entire class with you. That's not how it works. Yeah. School is not a team game. It's not. You graduate and you all go to different cities. That's the reality. And if you didn't set yourself up to succeed in those four or five years, man, good luck, right? right? So it, a brand <laughs> is your future. Whether you like it or not, you don't like the word, fine. Call it something else. I don't care. But set these kids up so that when they walk into a room, that interviewer already knows who they are and is already anticipating wanting to give them the job because they've been reading about them and seeing them and hearing about them. Yeah. Well, I think I'll never forget this. I spoke to a team uh, two years ago, and this was right after we kind of started doing some serious work together. And uh, a player on the team came up, and he was a specialist. So he's a kicker or a punter. Mm -hmm. And he goes, hey, man, like, how come you've never told my story on TV? And I go, well, I don't know it. Uh, and he goes, well, I want to tell you. And I go, cool. I go, have you ever shared it on your social platforms? And he goes, no, I don't really like social media. And I was like, well, let me just tell you, as, as a broadcaster, what I do every Thursday night, it's my favorite thing to do. I take 10 players on every team, and I go through their most recent tweets. Hmm. And I could predict every game based on like i'll text like my broadcast partners and be like dude this guy's gonna struggle because <laughs> on thursday night he was like yo what's good who wants to hit it who wants to go out you know yeah. who wants to you know hit the town or whatever it is like well, what, a, what can, I, can we just say right there what a lesson that is that's another thing i'll tell you real quick i don't mean to interrupt but yeah. what you're saying is such a lesson for everybody out there and i say this all the time i won't name the conference but i go to this conference uh almost every year it's about the dis the it's about communication. It's about press, getting PR. And I'll tell you, every year, you know who's not there? The media. The media is not there. How, how are you going to talk about getting press and you're not going to ask the media what they want and what they need? So right here, what you just said, that you look every Thursday night at 10 players Twitter and you want to talk about brand and how do you manage a brand? Well, guess what? These people are paying attention. So you tweet something stupid and you and it doesn't seem like you're taking your, your job seriously and it's a job, whether you're a general student or not, it's a job. Yeah. Then guess what? You've just been stamped and labeled as something. You took the words out of my mouth. That's what I told the kid. I said, I'm, I'm reading your bio on the media packet that I'm given by your sports information director. And that's my intel because I'm probably not spending my time to interview you after practice. So tell me. You know, share with me, send it to me, and we'll gladly, like, the media, I think, want, especially in sport, it can be painted negatively, but fundamentally, everyone who's in the media was either a former athlete or wish they were an athlete. They want to be close to athletics. They want to share great stories, specifically high school, college. And even in the pros, I think in the climate we're in now, people want, like, good news, good stuff, inspire me, yeah. impact me, versus contract disputes, negative, torn up locker room. So, and, I, and I think that a, a big takeaway, and you taught me this even, is like, well, clearly you're the author of all of those things. So as we wrap up here, man, I want to um, really talk to the athlete here from you. You've, you're working on a new book, and I'm not going to spoil it. I'll let you do that if you want to. But you've got to, I'd love you to give our audience a couple things outside of look in the mirror. We started there. I mean, you literally, just to give people some inside baseball, you had me take selfies of me in the mirror for 10 straight days. Yep. That was the first thing we did in my brand work that you and I did together. So if, if that was already one thing for them to do, to see what they're wearing and why they're wearing and the choices they put on their body, what are a couple other tools for kids that, that hey, I, I want to develop a side hustle. I want to develop a brand, but I'm coming from a tiny town or everybody's telling me I should be the next this, that, and the other thing, but I don't really know where to start. What would you tell them? Well, I'll say a couple things. One, read read a ton of books and not textbooks. Don't read textbooks. I mean, you have to when you're in school, obviously. But I'll ask a class and I, and I have a bunch of classes that I, I, I speak to uh, every, every term. And I'll ask them, raise your hand if you're reading a book outside of school about whatever it is that you want to be in professionally. And no hands are raised. And I say, that's your first mistake. You're not outworking everybody else and you're not reading from the minds that are out there actually on the ground doing this stuff. So you got to read, read a book. Come on, man. You got, I, I read a stat that said 
nearly 50% of, of college graduates never read another book the rest of their lives once they graduate. That's insane. Oh, that hurts. I mean, who knows how valid that is? It's on the internet. <laughs> so who knows? Accurate. But yeah. if, even if it's 30%, even if it's 20%, that is crazy to me. You know, that's the first thing you got to read. You got to, you got to build your, your acumen. I didn't, I didn't just learn everything on the job. Of course I learned a lot, but I was reading, I was consuming books like it was water and air, you know, Seth Godin, Scott Bedbury, Malcolm Gladwell. I was reading those things at 20, those, those authors at 21, 22, 23, while everybody else was partying. The second thing, and it's the biggest thing that it's the most important element of any marketing plan is the, is the positioning statement. Now, most people don't know what that is. It's essentially a single sentence that defines what it is that makes you different amongst your competition, okay? You can't figure that out unless you do all the research that we talked about earlier. You got to do all the, the digging and understanding yourself, understanding the industry, understanding the competition. But that's the one, that's the element that will drive every decision that you make from here on out. You and I talk about that. You have one now. And how, how much of a game changer is it? Dude. I mean, I was so pumped because uh, I spoke at South by Southwest and you were there and it was, uh, it was a really powerful moment for me to have you in the audience because I was going to lead with my, positions, my, <laughs> position, my position statement. Yeah. And if anybody's ever gone to a panel, the, bay, the, way, the, bay, the, the way that it works is, Jeremy, tell me about yourself. Yogi, tell me about yourself. So-and-so, tell me about yourself. And I was like, I can't wait to tell him about myself. <laughs> yeah. And the quote and it's still on the front page of my website and it was vulnerable and scary to put it out there but i said the following quote i am seeking and uncovering the humanity in sports around the globe and you were in the audience i don't know if you felt it but i felt like a like a mic drop moment like to start the thing and it was like whoa i'm gonna listen to this cat yeah i got chills when you said it obviously i mean the work that we did together it was like a baby that, that was born um that's what that's what brands are to me. It's like that positioning statement is our baby now. You know, we are carrying that baby and like growing that baby, and it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch you grow it, but you need that. If you're an athlete, get out there, read some books as much as you can, do the research, dig into yourself, dig into the industry, and find your differentiator and write that sentence down. Because at that point, choosing that between job A and job B is a lot easier. You know. Choosing what to put on Twitter is a lot easier. Choosing what to wear in the morning, like you talked about, is a lot easier when you know what your brand is. That's your North Star. You know, it's like having a, a map. I love that. All right. So what's your position, positioning statement? Oh, nobody can know that. Okay. All right. Well, I know you have one because people have done it, the work. Here's the deal. If I have to tell you what it is, then it's not there yet, right? I haven't done my job yet. Mm. But I, I would imagine, because all I talk about is, you know, this very narrow thing, that most people would come back with that very narrow thing, and that's the point, right? Yeah. I say it, I, I stay focused for a reason. Finish the following sentence. It all comes down to... As far as brand goes? As far life. as you go. Okay. Hmm, that's tough, man. These are big questions. I think it all comes down to happiness and that's so, so corny or maybe enjoyment. Here's the thing. I work my butt off. I like a lot of it, but man, I got to get to a place where I'm enjoying all of it. You know, nine to nine, it's a grind and it, I only do it because I do love building brands. I do love working in sports. I do love with, with working with athletes. Um, but I will say, I don't love all of the elements that come with building a brand. And I think I'm trying to figure out how do I cut the, cut the fat, you know, and be okay with, oh, I, I like podcasts and I like writing. Maybe that's it, you know. I think uh, we all have to come to terms with that stuff sometimes. But for me, the biggest thing is you got to love it. You got to enjoy every minute of it. I love that. So right now, what are you seeking? Oh, man. You know, I think I need to do, I need to find the peace outside of work and outside of writing and outside of all of that, you know, it's like an athlete becomes their identity becomes their team or their, their sport. I think the last few months I've been so focused on this next book that I've lost, I've, I've 
it's harder for me to, to relax right now because I'm thinking about the book, I'm thinking about work, I'm thinking about building. And I think Americans struggle with that. Our society is set up and we're taught to grind, grind, grind. And yeah, you have to. I mean, that's how I got to where I am. But I also need to figure out, I think we all need to figure out you know, how do we find that, that moment of just peace? And you, you and I talked about it. You do, you know, you do your, um, um, meditation, you know, that might be my answer, but I need that, that moment of peace. And how do you feel about the word limits? I don't believe in limits at all. Yeah. I mean, I grew up poor and I, there's no reason for me to be here. There's no reason for me to have two books. There's no reason for me to be the, to have my dream job, you know, uh, to be a consultant, to work with the LA Rams, to, you know, to be with you right now talking about this, there's no reason at six years old and the circumstances that I was in that you would think that I could do that. And that's the thing, man, you could do whatever you want. I love it. Dude, this is, it's been a great journey with us. I'm so happy yeah. that, uh, our mutual friend Taylor Cavanaugh, who's been on this podcast connected mm-hmm. us and, uh, and thanks for going there today, man. You, you didn't have to share like you did and it's going to have a profound impact on our audience. Well, I appreciate it. I think you, you bring that that sort of uh, tone out of people and it's you make it comfortable so I appreciate it best way for people to connect with you it's all about Twitter for me uh, at Jeremy Darlow I love it alright so that's Jeremy Darlow I'm Yogi Roth trust me he saved me 10 years on my career because of the one plus years that we really went to work together and it all began I can't believe it with my first ever mirror selfie when I took that <laughs> picture man. yeah it did uh, but one of the best of all time a great friend Jeremy thanks for coming on bro thank you